Hi, I'm Molly Matthews. I hope you enjoy this free excerpt from my popular book, Claimed by the Sheik. If you do, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit like for more free excerpts and insights into my creative process. Prologue The traffic on the motorway started to speed up as they got closer to Charlotte's husband's new office in the French headquarters of the Fédération Internationale de Football Association in southern France. Salim was still asleep in the back seat when Charlie looked at her watch and realised it was nearly 1am and they were going to be late to pick up Zayed. If he was exhausted, as he often was at the end of a long day, she knew he wouldn't wait. He had been working so hard rebuilding his life to provide for her and Salim. Tonight had been a special celebration. She was proud that he had won the election to be the new FIFA president. His campaign focused on change, football ideals, and uniting warring countries through their common passion for sport. She didn't want to be late. Charlie grabbed her iPhone from the dashboard and placed it in her lap to send him a text when Salim suddenly woke. Don't drive and text, Mommy, he said disapprovingly. You'll cause an accident. I just want to tell Daddy that we're running a few minutes late, but we're almost there. Otherwise, he'll grab a ride with one of his staff and leave before we arrive. Charlie looked down and started texting quickly, holding the steering wheel firm with one hand. Ten minutes later, Salim saw his father first as they approached the building where he worked. Daddy, he cried. Charlie pulled to the curb, got out of the car and opened the passenger door. Selim had already unbuckled his seatbelt and climbed out of his booster seat. He ran to his father. Zayed scooped him into his powerful arms and drew Charlie to his side. His sheer strength and physicality always made her swoon and she leaned into his chest. Mahaban Habiti, hello, my love. How's my favorite team? he said, placing a kiss on Charlie's lips before turning to Salim and kissing his chubby cheeks. You must be tired, Charlie said. Zayed heaved a deep breath, sucking the early morning air into his lungs, exhausted. I'll drive, Charlie said. Why don't you sit in the back and take a nap? I don't want you to be too tired to give me some space. Special attention when we get home, she laughed, planting a sloppy kiss on his sexy lips. She was thinking about Melanie and how grateful she was to her sister as she embraced Salim and Zayed. She wanted to take a selfie of them and send her a text, but they agreed not to stay in contact. Those were the rules. Besides, they had their own busy lives in separate worlds. She wasn't obligated to all, but she wanted to but she didn't want to upset her or re-traumatise her sister either. It wouldn't be fair to her, not when Charlie was so happy and Melanie was all alone, without Salim. Charlie swallowed back the little trace of guilt that she never managed to kick and smiled as she watched Syed clamber into the car, curling his long, powerful frame like a contortionist into the back. He waited for Selim to climb in and rested his head against the booster seat and fell asleep. She was so happy. She didn't need to be a princess. She didn't need Zayed's royal title. All she needed was her two favourite men, she thought, as she pressed the keyless start and pulled out from the curb. Charlie wanted to get home quickly. Both her boys needed to be in their beds. She hadn't wanted to leave Salim with a babysitter and was feeling a little reprehensible for lifting him from his warm bed to pick up his dad. But she knew how much Zayed had missed them both. He had been working so hard and tonight had been a well-earned celebration. Thankfully, their home was only a fast 40-minute trip on the A7 auto route du Soleil. They hadn't travelled far when Salim's eyes suddenly fluttered open. You're not wearing your seatbelt, he censored. Charlie glanced at him in the rearview mirror and noticed that Salim and Zayed weren't buckled in either. She'd heard the chime, but she'd been distracted, worrying about Melanie and how she must be suffering. She'd been rushed and stressed all day. Neither are you, Charlie said, turning around. I forgot, Mommy, Salim said. 
He rubbed his sleepy eyes and started to put his seatbelt on, but it was caught in the door and he couldn't. He tugged and pulled on it. It's stuck, Mommy. Charlie's heart raced. She turned to keep her eyes on the road. She was sitting right on the legal speed limit of 80 miles per hour. It always felt so fast. Behind and in front of her was a line of other cars, and there was no room to pull over. She couldn't stop now without causing an accident. We'll be home in a minute, darling, she said, glancing at Salim again in the rearview mirror. The words had barely left her mouth when his eyes flew wide in horror. He saw a huge tourist bus careering toward them from the left. Salim screamed, and Charlie turned too late. The bus hit them with monstrous force. Zayed woke and hurled his body across his son instinctively. There was the sound of crushing metal and splintering glass as Charlie's cell phone flew from her hand. Selim watched in horror as his mother shot through the windshield like a torpedo. She careered through the air and disappeared under the cars in front. Their SUV struck another, stopped abruptly, and Selim and his father were crushed amongst a mangled heap of other cars. The bus had shunted them three lanes over, and the driver lay motionless with his head on the steering wheel as people rushed from their cars toward him and several others ran towards Charlie's car. The sky was ablaze with tiny lights from their cell phones as people were calling the emergency services. A crowd was staring at Charlie under the vehicle where she had landed, covered with blood and broken glass. Traffic was backed up behind them, and within minutes sirens screamed in the distance. People wandered dazed and numb with shock as they surveyed the carnage. The driver of the bus was concussed and staggered from the wreck, but there was no sign of life under the car where Charlie had landed. Salim lay beneath his father's powerful body, his head, face and arms covered with blood. No one dared touch Salim or Zayed for fear of injuring them further, and no one knew if they were alive. As they waited for the emergency services to arrive, it looked hopeless. But there was so much blood and twisted metal everywhere, no one could see clearly. A paramedic team arrived by helicopter. The crew pulled Salim and Zayed from the wreckage. Zayed was pronounced dead, and Salim was immediately assessed as in a critical condition. They inserted a breathing tube before they left the scene and airlifted him to a hospital in Montpellier with life-threatening head injuries. More paramedics and emergency services arrived, including an ambulance, sirens shrieking and lights flashing. They removed Charlie and Zayed's body from the scene, and it was hours before traffic began moving again. In total, two people were dead and eight people had been injured, but none severely except Salim. The police and paramedics had said Zayed had died instantly when his skull was crushed against the hard surface of the television in the back seat of the car. When Charlie was thrown through the windshield and hit the pavement, she had died on impact. It was a tragedy made less horrific by knowing death had come instantly and they hadn't suffered. The police found a blue backpack with an image of Simba from the movie The Lion King and a soft toy of Simba too on the floor of the car. The backpack had a name badge with Salim's name on it, and Charlie's purse with her driver's license was crushed in the front passenger seat, together with her cell phone. The screen was shattered, but they could still see the picture of Charlie, Zayed and Salim smiling on the home screen. Charlie and Zayed were taken to the morgue by the police. There was nothing in Charlie's purse or Zayed's wallet listing next of kin, or who to notify in an accident. All they knew for now were their names and that they weren't French. The paramedics had assessed that Salim had a serious head injury, a broken arm and probably internal injuries. The police noted that none of them had been wearing seatbelts. All the police could deduce was that Charlie hadn't seen the oncoming bus and possibly had been on his cell phone or texting, and both were common causes of accidents and fatalities. Beyond that, they knew nothing, not even whether Selim would survive the accident. It looked unlikely when they'd left the scene and flew at full speed to Montpellier Hospital. Kill her? Tarak Nahasir, the formidable ruler of the Kingdom of Ivana, seized the animal handler's arm, forcing him to release the rope laced around the baby giraffe's neck. 
She has suffered enough trauma. Tarek dismissed the man with a fierce scowl that struck fear into enemies. A slither of panic crept into the young man's hushed apology. I am sorry, Your Excellency. Release the others from their cages, Tarek growled. The man did not have to be asked twice. He knew from experience that the sheik's retribution for disobedience would be swift and merciless. You are safe from harm, Tariq said softly, stroking the baby giraffe's long neck with a gentleness that belied his strength. No one will ever hurt you again, Noir, he said softly, impulsively naming her as his fingertips swept through the calf's fur. He let his long, subtle fingers linger a moment upon her tail. Thankfully, they had saved her in time, he thought, as he reached for the reins, clenching his powerful hands around the soft leather. The rage he had first felt on hearing about the ruthless murder of the newborn's mother still roared through him. Had she been executed to pay a tailed dowry to the father of some money-mongering bride, he wondered, or did some heinous person pay thousands of dollars for a wretched fly-swatter? Noir looked up and met Tarek's dark gaze. In her innocent eyes he saw her despair, her disillusionment, her disgust with humanity. He recognized her trauma as though it was his own, because it was. Humans, he said, his voice marinated with contempt. The people you should be able to trust, the people who say they care, the people whose actions should be driven by love. The majority and driven by nothing but selfishness, deception, and lies. Taking a bottle of milk, he placed the teat to Noir's lips. The calf's silky black lashes grazed her cheeks as she gazed down at the foreign object and looked back at Tarek. She stared silently up at him, her eyes moist and bewildered. Tarek had trained himself to shut down his emotions, but that skill suddenly failed him. His chest trembled with suppressed rage, knowing the orphaned baby would never again taste her mother's milk. What passes for love amongst some people is abhorrent, he said in a low, strained voice. On behalf of humanity, I apologize. The killing of the calf's mother and three other rare... Cordofan giraffes by trophy hunters seeking their tails further motivated the sheik's commitment to transform his anger into action. Do you really think you can save her? Tarek looked at Anwar, his younger brother, by eleven months. His head was slightly bowed, but he could see his eyes were fixed in sadness and longing. Tension ripped down Tarek's spine. Our father's reign of terror and tyranny have robbed Ivana of prosperity and peace. I will make it my personal mission to right the injustices of the past. War and hostility must end, and it starts with how we treat those most vulnerable. His fingers shook as he gripped the bottle of milk as Noir at last began to suckle. An eerie silence swept across the precipitous landscape of Ivana's Tiwa oasis. Tarek lifted his gaze to the horizon. The only movement visible to his naked eye was the wind etching a delicate furrow as it crawled over the golden dunes. Not only will I provide a sanctuary for hunted wildlife and orphans like Noir, but I will liberate God's most precious creatures from the many closing zoos and other inhumane habitats around the world. He glanced over at the other animals being unloaded from the custom-built crates. I will create a world-acclaimed sanctuary, impenetrable by those with impure and malicious hearts. It will be the most magical, marvellous, mesmerizingly unique place, the number one ecotourism destination in the world. I will create meaningful employment for our people, restoring their dignity, attracting millions of visitors annually, and contributing billions to the economy. But more importantly, I will show the world how Kindness and compassion can be turned into plutonium and change the world. Anwar glanced at the now lush landscape and recalled how barren it had once been. With no sign of life in sight, others had found it impossible to fathom his brother's vision to transform the punishing and unforgiving conditions into a haven for so many endangered species. Yet, as with everything Tarek turned his formidable will and mind-blowing wealth to, he had succeeded where mere mortals were destined to fail. 
Anwar's heart swelled with pride as he thought of all his brother's achievements. It's an audacious and admirable plan, and if anyone can pull it off, it's you, brother. Your passion, your drive, your unrelenting ambition and pursuit of goals exceeds mere mortals, and you have the endurance and power of 13,000 Arabian horses, but aren't you setting yourself up for far too much hard work? Why don't you relax, kick back, enjoy the fruits of your reign? Anwar said, tossing his head in the direction of the harem. Other men would. Women were our father's weakness. Bitterness bled from Tarek's words. I too once made the same mistake. I too paid the price. There was a tense silence while Tarek lifted his gaze to the sky and studied the giant falcon circling above. Was it not you who once taught that your greatest weakness can also be your greatest strength? Anwar asked. Tarek shook his head, biting down a tense retort. I was misled, he said, nodding his command to the animal handler lingering at a respectable distance. He petted Noah as she was led away. All kinds of atrocities are committed in the name of love, which is why it is the most dangerous of emotions, and why I am forever turned off to women. I hope you enjoyed this excerpt from Claimed by the Sheik. If you did, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. You'll find the purchase links in the comments below. And you may also love to read the next book in the series, Love in Venice, where the beautiful sheiks make another appearance.